Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. It seems I'm just fortunate enough to get my massive king size mattress box outside of the frame here which I had to pick up because my butt was getting too big for my full size bed. Um, so this is another week uh, because I'm finally done with my traveling where uh, I am low energy and don't have very much time. And so like other situations where that's the case for me, I'm going to give it about five minutes of wholehearted effort and then I'm going to sign off and probably not talk to you again for a week. So let's go ahead and get into it. Today we are talking about Debezium. All right, so as I was saying, I think this should be a pretty short one because a lot of it is just going over the uses of change data capture. Um, but nonetheless, let's talk about it. So Debezium is a technology that was open sourced in 2016 uh, out of Red Hat. So basically what it does for you is it allows you to do CDC. CDC is something that I spoke about a lot in my systems design videos and I feel like a lot of people aren't as familiar with it because I guess if this comes out in 2016 it's a fairly new thing, all things considered, and I don't think that many people use it when perhaps they should be because I think it has a lot of great applications and Debezium lets you do those really really quickly. So it supports a bunch of different source and sync databases uh, in the event that you want to basically stream the changes from one of them to another. So at a high level, what is change data capture? Well basically if I'm a client and I'm writing to some sort of source database, CDC is going to allow me to stream those changes to a bunch of different sync technologies. So, you know, it could be something like Elasticsearch, uh, Data Warehouse, Flink, who knows. Uh, but the point is, um, you know, all of those writes are going to be ingested downstream. Cool. So what would be a really bad way of doing CDC uh, or trying to implement it architecturally? Um, well, I guess number one is you could just pull the database every once in a while. Uh, you could do so on an interval, uh, you would detect new changes, and then that's just going to be a, a bunch of extra work for the database. They have to handle a bunch of read queries, uh, you're probably hitting it uh, to do those queries when you don't necessarily need to, and so that seems kind of stupid. Number two is going to be based off database triggers. So database triggers are just you know random pieces of code that you can trigger uh, when you make certain writes. And uh, that's fine too, but again, a lot of extra work for the database. Potential consistency issues as well there too, uh, depending on how you make your actual triggers. So neither of these are probably the ideal solution. So what does Debezium do? How does its architecture work? Well, it's using uh, log-based change data capture. So the main idea here is that basically every single database for fault tolerance or for replication has some sort of log that it maintains of the writes that happened, right? There's always gonna be some sort of like write-ahead log, assuming it's an on-disk database, uh, or a replication log. And so depending on which one it is, obviously there has to be different implementations of Debezium for every single source database. Uh, you know, you can hook into that and basically streamline those changes out to other systems. So you're going to take those changes, you're going to convert them into a database agnostic format, and then you're going to push them out to other places. So what does a database agnostic format looks like? Well, basically it's just like some JSON where, you know, maybe you've got a type, so it could be create, update, delete, maybe a schema change, depends. Uh, you'll have some information about the actual fields in the record that you're uh, you know, sending over. So for example, you've got a name, which is a string for Jordan, and a length, which is an int for nine. I'm actually not sure what that category refers to. It could be something. Um, and then the idea here is that, you know, again, you can do this for updates and deletes as well. It's going to be database agnostic. And the beauty of that is that you can then take that data and push it out to other systems who can all handle it because it's database agnostic, right? Like, we're not putting any uh, disk addresses or memory addresses or you know primary key IDs or anything like that in here. It's purely just going to be the data. Uh, one small thing about updates that I saw when I was looking at the Debezium documentation is that you can also have update rows where instead of just having the before and after of the row, you can also just include the difference between them and the, the actual fields to, to make that message size a bit smaller. Cool. So what does Debezium message delivery look like? Well, pretty simple. Basically, you've got your source database here. Imagine that's like MySQL or something. You've got Debezium. Uh, so Debezium kind of operates in two places, right? You've got your source connector, which is basically going to be continuously reading the log of the source database, and then ultimately publishing that out to Kafka, which we'll discuss why we use that in a second. Debezium as well is responsible for something known as the sync connector. Both the source connector and the sync connector are connected to Kafka using something called Kafka Connect. And then the sync connector is basically going to take that data in and then send it to any of the sync nodes that we have configured uh, with Debezium. So, you know, again, this could be like Elasticsearch or it could be uh, Flink or anything like that. And so the reason that we use Kafka here as opposed to just going, hey, you know, I have my source connector, why don't we just send it to all the syncs? Well, there's a few reasons. For one, uh, it makes this entire process asynchronous, which is good because these writes can be expensive and hard to process. 
Uh, and number two is that uh, we get at least once message delivery, right? Because Kafka is a log-based message broker, all of those writes are going to be persistent, at least for some amount of time. And it means that if anything fails in the sync connector, we can just go ahead, reread the event, and retry it. Now, all of these events should be handled idempotently, right? Because they're just like individual database writes. So it really shouldn't be too hard to get this done. And then of course, by virtue of using Kafka, it means that you know we can have many consumers reading from that log and it's easy to do. We don't have to have the source connector, which is responsible for already transforming all of these writes into a database agnostic format, responsible for dissipating all of those writes to a bunch of different nodes. It's a good, uh, I would say, decoupling of work. Cool, so what are some sources and syncs that Debezium actually supports? Uh, if you're using any of these databases on the left, all of which are pretty popular, da, 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 note that they're all transactional databases. This is kind of all like for row-based writes and you know transactional applications. Cassandra, Vitesse, Spanner, Informix. And pretty much in terms of syncs, any database that works with JDBC. So JDBC is just going to be some sort of abstraction layer uh, where you know from your program, you can use JDBC to write to any database just about. Uh, or any database that has a JDBC implementation, which is going to be the majority of them. So on the sync front, super duper flexible. On the source front, you're getting there. It's pretty flexible at this point as well. It probably supports your use case. Okay, data snapshotting. So this is a small point, but uh, probably worth discussing. Uh, Debezium is log-based, right? And so if you have something like a write-ahead log, eventually it's going to be compacted because the write-ahead log can't grow uh, infinitely in size. Otherwise, your database uh, and your hard drive on it would run out of storage. So eventually, you know, you'll compact your write-ahead log, you'll squeeze together writes to the same key and just keep the most recent ones. And so I guess the question there is, you know, well, how is this going to work for uh, Debezium itself? Because let's say you've got a database that already has a million writes, the log has already been compacted. Uh, you need to now stream this to other downstream systems. Basically what Debezium will do is it'll just send a full table snapshot, or you also have the option to only send over partial snapshots of the table uh, over Kafka, and then you can handle those in your downstream consumers. Cool, so let's go over a few use cases for change data capture. Why does Jordan glaze it so much? Why does he think it's so profound? Well, uh, I'm gonna go over a bunch of them. So basically one way to use CDC is to basically take your data in one source database, which could be of any type, maybe X, and put it in a database of type Y. Why is that gonna be useful? Well, because a lot of the time this is going to optimize reads for you, right? If all of your writes are going to like a write optimized database, the source one, you can basically you know, make it so that you have eventual consistency between your source database and your reading databases, and then you're going to be able to serve reads better. So this is obviously gonna be the case for something like a data warehouse or a data lake house, where you can take advantage of column-oriented storage, compression, things like that. Uh, it's going to be the case for just like a heterogeneous replica. Maybe uh, our writing database is using an LSM tree architecture, and then our reading database is using B trees or B plus trees. Uh, and then as far as search indexes go, uh, hopefully that's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, inverted indexes are going to speed up our reads by quite a bit. Also, by virtue of having data in Kafka, eventually we may want to sync it to another database, but we effectively get an audit log of our changes, right? So a database is only going to store the most recent state of all of your changes, but if we want to know what every single write was uh, to get us there, having this audit log is going to make that very possible. Now, of course, we could also do this in the reverse, right, with something like event sourcing, where you actually first write to Kafka, and then everything flows into a source database. So that's called event sourcing as opposed to change data capture. But then you no longer have synchronous writes for users, so there's a downside to that as well. More use cases, okay, another one would be cache consistency, right? If we have a bunch of caches like Redis, we want to basically keep them relatively in line with the database. They can be stale, but we don't want them to be too stale, right? Keep in mind that all of this CDC stuff is eventually consistent. So in this case, you know, you write to your database, those changes get propagated into Kafka, they flow into your Redis instance, and that way you at least stay relatively up to date on Redis. Another thing is doing some amount of data windowing, right? So maybe, for example, uh, you know, we have a bunch of Facebook posts. Uh, we want to group all of them within 30-minute windows and compute some aggregate statistic on them. Maybe we could have Flink as a downstream connector. And so, of course, Flink has a bunch of windowing functionalities that you can go ahead and do that. And, you know, maybe you're computing the average number of characters or the number of hashtags in posts over a 30-minute time span and then putting that in some other database. This would be a really easy way to do it. Even more use cases, they just get better than better. So a term that I learned through doing this research, which I mean, I guess conceptually I've understood it, but I just haven't heard this term before, is CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. 
So basically the idea here is similar to the one that we went ahead and talked about in uh, this first slide here, which is that uh, you, know, you can have basically write optimized views and read optimized views, and you can use CDC to maintain the two of them. So one example here would be partitioning by a certain field or maybe indexing by a certain field over a distributed database. The idea is that uh, Debezium is actually going to allow you to tell um, it how to partition messages in Kafka, right? So even if a message is partitioned by X over here, you can basically say, hey, Debezium, take the hash of field Y, put it in Kafka such that, you know, the, the Kafka partitions are by field Y, and then that way every single, uh, you know, like sync connector is just writing to one partition, so the sync writes are uh, more efficient as well. And then you're partitioning by field Y. Technically, you probably don't even have to do that, and the sinks themselves could, could handle that new partitioning logic. But the point is now, because we're partitioned by field Y, uh, you know, if requests are kind of always based on trying to find all rows with the field Y, uh, then this is going to be a more read-optimized view for them. Uh, one of my favorite use cases that I use in systems design videos all the time, and I think people kind of give me shit for it as well, I don't know why, is avoiding dual rights, right? So one really bad thing that uh, we see ourselves doing, because it's easy to do, is, you know, let's first write to database one, and then we're gonna to write to database two. And we need those perfectly kept in sync, right? The problem with that is that we can have partial failure scenarios. What if the write to database one succeeds and this guy fails? Well, now all of a sudden they're out of sync and there's not really anything we can do to get them back in sync except for retrying the event, which may or may not happen. There's no guarantee. What would be a lot better is if we just made one write and we know that if that one write succeeds, eventually, both of these databases are going to be in sync with one another. The way that we do that is by using CDC from our source database. It goes in Kafka, it reaches our sync connector, and the sync connector is going to update both of these guys over here. Now you might say, oh, but there's a partial scenario, uh, or partial failure scenario from the sync to the two databases. What if this guy on the bottom were to fail? Well, then the sync as a whole would recognize that uh, the process that it has to run on that particular message failed. It would go back to Kafka, say, hey, I'm going to replay that again. And because all of these messages are idempotent, it's going to keep retrying until both of those databases are in line with one another. This is going to allow us to avoid something like a two-phase commit in the bad scenario, which again is just going to impact performance as well. So as long as you're okay with eventual consistency, this is something that is going to keep our two databases in line. One more use case that they talk about a little bit in uh, the Debezium video that I'm mostly referencing here is actually going to be their use in microservices. Um, so this is actually kind of news to me because I just don't work with microservices as often, unfortunately. But um, I guess the idea is, you know, you could have an API between microservices and they could all be hitting one another with REST endpoints. Uh, you could also have two microservices share a database, but that's highly frowned upon because then they're very coupled. So one thing uh, that one of the Debezium engineers recommends is you can actually use change data capture to keep the databases of microservices eventually consistent, which I think is a pretty good idea. It's better than polling. Um, I guess you get some replayability or exactly once guarantees as opposed to API calls between one another. Uh, and then if you're splitting out a microservice from a monolith, let's imagine you know we've got a monolith it's responsible for some amount of data, and then you're splitting out a microservice that's now responsible for some subset of that data. What you can basically do is you split out the microservice, you start having uh, users read from the microservice, you use CDC so that uh, the monolith is now sending all of its incoming writes to the microservice, so the microservice is now eventually consistent with the monolith, and then eventually when you feel ready to do so, you know, you've tested everything out, you switch over the incoming writes to the microservice, and then that way it's now uh, self-sufficient for its subset of the data. Cool. In conclusion, basically Debezium is going to be doing log-based change data capture, which is going to be more efficient than poll-based or trigger-based change data capture. Uh, again, because all of these writes in the log already exist, it is a very, very low overhead solution on your database, which is great. Uh, all of these events are database agnostic, which allows us to consume them in many different downstream systems. And thankfully, they use Kafka to ensure at least once message delivery and also asynchronous processing so we don't end up overloading uh, our downstream systems, which is very, very nice. 
Uh, change data capture, like we just went through, has many different great use cases. Uh, we can use, uh, you know, read optimized views or derived data or CQRS, whatever you want to call it. We can avoid partial failure scenarios and we can make our lives easier when it comes to dealing with microservices. Anyways, guys, hopefully I have presented the utility of this technology in this video because I get shit on it constantly, uh, or I get shit on for it constantly in the systems design videos. And so here I am defending myself. Obviously soon I'm going to have to make a Flink video so everyone can shut up. And uh, yeah, until then, I will call it a day. I hope you guys have a great week, and I'll see you in the next one.